Hello aspirants, looking at current affairs for 9th Feb, the news items that we have picked up from the Hindu are these 15, we will look at them in detail. The first one, in a first, Supreme Court issues contempt notice to sitting High Court judge. We have already discussed this yesterday. So this was Justice C.S. Karnan. He was earlier a judge in Madras High Court. Now he has been transferred to Kolkata High Court. So the contempt proceedings which have been initiated against a sitting high court judge is for the first time. Means contempt of court. So this is initiated against individuals. But against a judge and also a sitting judge is for the first time in the history of the judiciary of India. So this has been initiated because of his rude behavior and statements which he has made against the judiciary, against the judges, the chief justice of Madras High Court and even the Kolkata High Court. So that all is coming forth before the Supreme Court. Also, we discussed yesterday about his behavior and action which he took. A, a case was initiated on his transfer. So the judge was transferred from Madras High Court to Kolkata High Court. Now all transfers and appointments of judges to high courts, all high courts and even the Supreme Court appointments take place through collegium system. So the collegium had decided this judge took the case of one himself for hearing about his own transfer. So he being a judge in his own case that actually goes against the principles of natural justice and he rejected that transfer order. So such unconstitutional illegal kind of behavior has been seen from him too. Presently, he is a judge in Kolkata High Court. So, Supreme Court is initiating this contempt proceeding. Now, it is treading untreated, untreaded waters. Means this region, this area has never been treaded earlier. Well, this has never been done before. So, that means for that, the Supreme Court is also in a dilemma whether it has the powers or not. And the Attorney General of India, Mukul Rohadki, he is guiding the Supreme Court and he says Supreme Court has constitutional powers. The powers lie with him. So, contempt proceedings can be initiated against anybody. It's not just that anybody means including the judge. He may be a sitting judge as well. So, that is that also Supreme Court is said to be the court of record. So, court of record means that he, the Supreme Court will maintain all the precedent cases. So, all cases, judgments which have been passed by the Supreme Court stay as a precedent. Only Supreme Court itself can revise its own judgments and also all high courts and over courts have to adhere to Supreme Court judgments. They cannot pass judgments against the Supreme Court judgment. So that all is also there. So also the Supreme Court has the power that if any high court or any other court contempt also takes place, the Supreme Court can look into that matter too. Means even if the judge has not directly has spoken bad about or having bad behavior towards the Supreme Court, but any other high court, high court judge, action can be taken by the Supreme Court. So, this one case is also highlighted. This is Union of India versus Sankal Chand Sheth judgment of 1977, in which the Supreme Court at that time had held that neither the President nor the Chief Justice of India had the, has the power to punish a judge for misconduct. So, that's what misconduct of judges, there are no provisions to punish them. As such, there is no detailed provision. Now you can see, you now contempt can also be not initiated against him. The only thing which can be done is either a judge is transferred or the judge is, uh, you know, impeached. So that is removed. Removal of the judge can take place. Otherwise, and that too takes place through the parliament. So I'm using the word impeachment means through the parliament, legislative body, that this impeachment also takes place. So, that is why removal of judges is quite an extreme step. So, there is nothing in between two. So, that was also one reason why National Judicial Appointments Commission was pushed by the government. So, that some procedure is made for even regulating the behavior of the judges. Though so another aspect which comes up is judicial interference. And if judiciary, judicial judges will be regulated, then how much of regulation it would be, by whom would it be, all those questions also arise and judicial independence also then may become questionable. But that's what the balance has to be maintained. So this is the status right now and which is also not a status quo we should maintain. We need reforms here. So judicial reforms are required, no doubt. So here again, misconduct has to be dealt with is what is highlighted in this scenario too. So this is regarding the whole issue. So presently what has happened is contempt notice has been issued. So we had discussed yesterday that the court would meet for the first time. So this is today 8 Feb that the court met for the first time. Next hearing would take place again on Feb 13 when he will be allowed to defend himself. So that will be on Feb 13. So again this is going to come in news and we will discuss it. 
so that is regarding this uh, this is regarding other judges also which have faced the supreme court uh, as such on impeachment or on removal so these are even judges have not been removed so far too so even that has been difficult so you can see judges go uh, scot free there is no regulation on them as such even removal has not been possible so there have been three judges against whom impeachment proceedings had been initiated for their removal this was justice v ramaswamy a supreme court judge whose removal impeachment proceedings had been initiated a motion took place in lok sabha but that failed because congress abstained from voting so here he could not be impeached then justice somitra sen this is a recent case in 2011 itself this was a judge of kolkata high court again his impeachment as i told you even high court judges removal is through the parliament not the state legislature through the parliament so impeachment is initiated rajya sabha voted in favor of his removal but then before the voting could take place further and his impeachment process could complete he resigned in 2011 same way this is justice pd dinakaran the chief justice of sikkim high court again he had corruption charges against him and he also resigned before his removal procedure can be initiated that was again in 2011 so these are the cases then the next news item is dam outseas to get compensation so this is regarding sardar sarovar dam on narmada river so the government is planning for co providing compensation to the families which will be displaced because of enhancement in this project so this is rupees 60 lakh per family which will be displaced for each 2 hectare of land which would be taken has been approved by the supreme court so this is the compensation which will be provided and the families will have to give an undertaking that they will vacate the land within a month and if they don't then they will have to be, they will be forcibly evicted from the land so this has been the supreme court statement it also says that monetary compensation is provided for because their land compensation could not be given as there is no land bank through which land could be compensated so which other land alternative land could be given there is no such facility available and also it says that the previous proposal which was there that a committee of former supreme court judges would be appointed to look into the compensation and rehabilitation issues this has this proposal has been withdrawn now so this has been the supreme court judgment facilitating this sardar sarovar project so there are number of projects which had been initiated on narmada dam this is the largest among the dams which had been proposed on narmada river and this was in 1990s this also protests which are going on against this large dams they will result in environmental hazards too plus also the people who would be displaced because of this and the compensation rehabilitation which they are provided as not sufficient so all these issues are resulting in protests under the banner of narmada bachav andolan and the leader of this the face of this revolt is the social activist medha patkar so this you can see narmada bachav andolan So this Sardar Sarovar Dam project on Narmada, this was initiated in 1979. So there are 30 dams which were proposed on Narmada River. So of course the purpose was irrigation, bringing in irrigation facilities and hydro electricity development. But then the other aspects which are there, the environmental hazard and the families, immediate people displaced, that was the major concern for the protests. Even World Bank was funding this Sardar Sarovar project, but then they withdrew in 1994. so this is regarding sardar sarovar project so present supreme court judgment is a step back actually that compensation would be monetary so though compensation has come forth but then regulation would not take place by the supreme court so supreme court has taken a step back on this the next news item is rbi keeps repo rate unchanged at 6.25% so by now you must be knowing that the key policy rates of the country like the repo rate what is repo rate i'll discuss once again so these are decided by a monetary policy committee which has been established in 2016 so since then this has been the case that repo rate comes through monetary policy committee earlier before that it was the rbi deciding this what is this monetary policy committee it is a body is comprising of the rbi member representatives also and the government also so that means three members are from rbi and three from the government and of course the chairman of monetary policy committee is the rbi governor and he has a casting vote so the decision should be taken by majority so if there is a tie then rbi governor would cast his vote so that is the case so this the thing is now in this case the repo rate will be decided by them has been decided and repo rate should be decided based on the 
purpose, the objective should be that inflation should be controlled. So, inflation should be in manageable limits and that target inflation targeting it is called. So, that means that 4% inflation is what is targeted and a band is provided plus minus 2%. So, in, it should lie within this band. That is the objective of monetary policy committee that repo rate should be decided on the basis of this. So, this was based on a recommendation by Urjit Patel committee, the committee which was set up before he became the RBI governor. So, now this is how monetary policy is decided. What is this repo rate? So, there are different types of rates. One is uh, repo rate, reverse repo rate, there is bank rate also. So, repo rate is the rate at which RBI provides loans to banks for short term basis. Bank rate is the, also the rate at which RBI provides loans to banks, but for a long term, longer term basis. So, that is how it is. And reverse repo rate is the rate at which RBI has to pay interest for money which it has taken from the banks. So, that is reverse repo. So, repo rate of course is higher. Reverse repo rate would be lower. So, it has bi-monthly review which is done by the monetary policy committee means in a year there would be six reviews. So, this is the last bi-monthly review for the financial year. So, because first April the new financial year, next financial year would begin. So, in this last bi-monthly review, RBI has kept the repo rate unchanged. It is same as it was earlier at 6.25 percent. So, this is one thing it has reason it is saying that this has kept been kept unchanged is because demonetization has caused uncertainties and there is no clear objective assessment which can take place of inflation pressures so this uh, this discoloration means it is vague we, uh, we don't know it is uncertain so because of this we are not changing the policy rate it is remaining at 6.25 percent but it has also made a statement it says that we have changed the policy stance now the accommodative position which we had taken will be switched to neutral position now. What does this mean is accommodative monetary policy means that a monetary policy should stimulate economic growth. So, when economic growth is not up to the expectations, then that you, how do you promote more economic growth? By allowing economy to prosper means if the interest rates are low, then people will take loans, businessmen would take loans, starts up would initiate, funding would be available, loans would be easily available. So, interest rates reduce means economic growth is pushed for. That is there. So, of course, another thing is that inflation should also stay under control. So, both have to be balanced. That economic growth should also take place and inflation also should be under control. So, that is why inflation basically means price rise, a general increase in prices as such. So, this accommodative monetary policy means it would mean that interest rate is going lower and lower. So, that is what RBI had been doing for so long. So, it was expecting that banks would also because they have to pay lower interest to RBI now they would also demand lower interest on the loans as such which would result in the economy effect seen in the economy. So, that is how the RBI wanted it to be pushed ahead that it is transferred, the effect is transferred to the actual economy as well through the banks. So, that was the accommodative monetary policy. Now, it says we are shifting this position to <laughs> neutral monetary policy. So, this means that the interest rate would go in uh, above or below in any direction as such. So, there is no accommodative stance anymore. Another important point is that all monetary policy committee members voted in for this decision that interest rate should remain unchanged. So, that is also that they have been working by consensus to uh, since such time. So, that is also good. Plus, another thing it the RBI pointed out is that risks to inflation outlook remain. So, means inflation should stay under control because risks are hardening global crude oil prices. So, since crude oil prices are becoming going higher and staying at that position. Earlier, the global oil, crude oil prices were lower going lower and lower because of international politics to Saudi Arabia had uh, been producing oil more than it, the market demands. Of course, oil prices went low. So, that was as an action taken against uh, USA and its initiative for having uh, shale gas production and all. So, that was another initiative which Saudi Arabia, policy of Saudi Arabia, but then now it has realized it was futile and now again global crude oil prices are starting to rise because again the Production has been controlled. So, it is OPEC, Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, they decide how much it is, uh, it's, you, you call it a uh, cartel. So, cartels are exporters or producers as such coming together and deciding the prices. 
so that is how crude oil prices presently are going high so that is one thing exchange rate remains volatile means rupee should stay strong against the dollar because here in usa also we are saying that seeing how the federal bank is deciding its policy rate so it will have its effect consequences too then also house rent allowances effect because of seventh pay commission recommendations because the price uh, the pay has been increased so when people have more money in their hands because of seventh pay commission recommendations government employees would get more money in their hands so then that is also a threat that that would result into inflation taking place because if there's no money with people means prices will also rise so that kind of risks are still there so it, it has to take those risks into consideration before deciding its inflation outlook and the repo rate as such. Then the next news item is from March 13, no curbs on cash withdrawal, RBI. So this complete uh, removal of all curbs which were there on withdrawal limits would take place from March 13. Earlier it has already lifted the withdrawal limits from current and cash credit accounts. Now from savings accounts to this withdrawal limits would be raised. It says for ATMs the withdrawal limit which is there which was also there earlier that remains otherwise as much as banks allow otherwise other withdrawal limits have been removed will be removed from March 30. The next news item is center to install 150 quake sensors in Uttarakhand. So we have seen one earthquake which took place in North India on 7th I suppose two days back. So now India is planning to have six times the number of earthquake sensors which it already has. We presently have only 20 stations in Uttarakhand in northern India to have earthquake sense and a study done on it to understand the geology and the evolution of the Himalayan earthquakes. So this will be increased to have better understanding now. This region is earthquake prone. We saw this yesterday about the earthquakes and about the plate tectonics and how earthquakes take place along the fault lines as the plates move. So this was just discussed yesterday only. So this is because Uttarakhand is North India is have is earthquake prone because it lies at the junction of two tectonic plates. This is the Himalayan plate and the Eurasian plate. So they push against each other because of which earthquakes do take place. So there have been many terrible earthquakes too. Disasters like 1991 Uttarkashi earthquake of 6.8 magnitude in which 700 people were killed. Then even Chamoli earthquake uh, again in 1991 killed another 100. So these severe earthquakes have also taken place. The earthquake on 6th Feb was of 5.8 magnitude. So it was not quite a disaster result, result in any death as such at that point of time but then experts say that this region Himalayan region a major quake is imminent because the strain which has been building for so long over the centuries it may erupt and you know that would be blasted off at any point of time which would result in a major earthquake taking place too so precautions have to be taken in this region the next news item is stalemate on krishna water release resolved so this is the andhra pradesh and telangana issue between the two states that the amount of water which was to be released so this was the nagarjuna sagar dam canal so this canal release of water was expected for the crops in andhra pradesh so these two districts are dependent on prakasham and guntur district in andhra pradesh are dependent on this water so this is 9.5 lakh acres of standing crops which are there here so release of water was sought and now Telangana government has finally agreed to implement the order for water release as the Krishna River Management Board had provided for. It says that earlier we did not release the water since last 21 days when it should have 21 days earlier because it says the provisions were unclear in the order. So anyway, so Krishna water dispute has also a long history. It was the Bachavat Tribunal of 1976 which had given its order. So this basically Krishna water dispute was between three states, Maharashtra, Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh. Now it has become four states because of formation of new state, Telangana from Andhra Pradesh. So even another tribunal had also been set up, Rajesh Kumar Tribunal. So even the tribunal orders are also not satisfactory. So the second order tribunal which was set up for additional allocation. So this was the additional allocation done by Rajesh Kumar Tribunal too. But then now after Telangana was formed as a new state, it was demanded that now again reallocation has to be done. But then the other states have said no, reallocation should not be done. Whatever is the share for Maharashtra, Karnataka should stay. Andhra Pradesh has been bifurcated. So this uh, share which Andhra Pradesh had has to be divided as the proportion may be between the two states. 
So that is what has been approved by the center as such too. So this is the provision award 1976 and 2010. And then based on the tribunal award too, this board is also set up, Krishna River Management Board. So it asks for release of water, which has presently been done after a delay. So this you can see. There are various interstate river water disputes, Kaveri water dispute we have been seen for long. So the entire detail has been provided here. So we have discussed it earlier. This graphic you can refer to it any point of time. Mahadai river again in which Karnataka is involved along with Goa. So here also the dispute is there. And then this is Krishna water which we are discussing right now. So this is between Maharashtra, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh and Karnataka too. Then the next news item is setback to Gates Foundation in India. So this has been regarding the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So it has been working in India and it has established this immunization technical support unit, ITSU. So this is Gates Foundation funded unit. And this is acting as a secretariat to National Technical Advisory Group on Immunization. So, this is the body which is the OPEX body for advising on the country regarding immunization. The so government's immunization program is all regulated, controlled, advisory functioning is done by this NITAGI, National Technical Advisory Group on Immunization. And this has been sec the secretariat for this is ITSU. So, means indirectly the funding here, the connectivity here lies. Means a NGO, an international NGO, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, funding a unit, support unit, which is the secretariat to Natagi. So, that's the whole thing. So, presently the government stand, initiative which has been taken is that Natagi has been moved out. So, it has been moved out to the health ministry now. So, it will function under the health ministry. The government would provide funding to it and this funding so indirectly which was provided through Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation would be stopped. So government has clarified it's only this aspect which has been ended. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation will be asked to collaborate. It will continue collaborating on the immunization policy and the national health mission because this was technical support group. So technical support we would still take but the funding aspect it has clarified because uh, RSS was also making a UN cry about this that how an international NGO is supporting and you know, funding a uh, technical immunization program as such. So why funding is coming from there? So the government has taken this step right now. Then the next news item is center not in favor of new law for CBI. So CBI, you should be knowing about it. Central Bureau of Investigation. It has been given powers under the Delhi Special Police Establishment Act. So that is an act of 1946, a pre-independence era act. And there is no specified law for CBI per se. So that is why the parliamentary committee is now recommending that is parliamentary committee on personal public grievances and law and order. So this is the departmentally related parliamentary committee as such. In its 85th report, it has recommended presently that the central government should consider framing a new law for CBI. This was a recommendation given earlier too in the same, this parliamentary committee in its 24th report had also given the same recommendation for CBI but that nothing has been done as of now and even presently it's saying that there are number of cases which are referred to the CBI, even states refer many cases to CBI, courts refer them. So then there is a need for giving it more powers. So there is the requirement that CBI should be able to manage its own cadre efficiently and even the recruitment process can be done efficiently through the UPSC. So for such provisions, it is required that a framework law should be formulated for CBI giving it sufficient powers as well. But the government says no, there is this cannot be done because specifically the thing is this police and law and order is a subject in the state list. So then the states have the domain in this making laws in this domain so then if the central government frames a law on this then it would uh, it would uh, you know change the balance and the federal feature as such which is there in the constitution so that is why the government has said that they are not keen and they will not enact a law as such even it says after the 24th report many changes have taken place cbi's functioning has improved its many measures have been taken to strengthen the CBI as such. So it has become a more dynamic and efficient organization now. So there is no need for a law to regulate it. 
so this is the government stand right now so you can see so this says this is conflict with entry 2 of list 2 so list 2 is in the three lists which are there under the seventh schedule of the constitution so this is list 2 is state list so this is law and order right then the next news item is hope stands on masood azhar hope stand on masood azhar won't affect ties with india so china is saying that they are hoping that the stand which they have taken on masood azhar that was a technical hold which they have placed on designating masood azhar as a terrorist international terrorist at the un security council committee so this technical hold it says we hope that this will not affect our ties with india so they have said that this has been done because there is no consensus on amongst the member countries on this issue so this resolution was actually initiated by usa and it was backed by britain and france so of the p5 countries us britain and france are initiating the proposal the initiative has been taken so of course they are favoring it china has put a technical hold and russia is also not against this so it is china which is trying to protect pakistan and putting this technical hold so we will see what happens further on this matter. This has been taking place since 2016. We have already discussed this yesterday only about how in 2016 they put a technical hold which went on for 6 months, extended for further 3 months and then finally rejected. Now this is the new proposal which has been initiated at the United Security Council 1267 committee. So once he is designated as an international terrorist then funding to him and his organization would also be ended. So that is the reason why India is pushing for this. The next news item is India to pitch global services accord to WTO chief as a veto. So we know about this too. WTO Director General Roberto Azevedo will be on a visit to India. So this has been discussed yesterday too that we are against including new issues in the proposals for the next WTO ministerial conference which will take place. It takes place every two years. So last one was in Nairobi in 2015 and now next one is in December 2017 in Argentina. So this was one aspect that new issues like e-commerce and investment which the developed countries are pushing for will not be included under the WTO negotiations till Doha development agenda is is completed so that is there now another proposal which india is making it says that we'll make a presentation to wto on trade facilitation in services agreement so this should be pushed at wto level too so we already have seen that trade facilitation in agreement tfa in on goods have already been passed so this has been approved ratified by all wto members and has been put into effect it was promoted as not been any new issue, no new proposal has been put forth in it. It is just trying to facilitate customs as such. The custom provisions in developing countries, they have been rationalized so that trade is facilitated. So that was the aspect. So the Indian government also says that trade facilitation in services is same as trade facilitation in goods. So here services should be facilitated. So this is again not any new issue put, pushed for. So this what would be basically aiming for is that movement of foreign skilled workers, professionals across the border for short term work should be facilitated. So this is the proposal. So they say a presentation would be made before the WTO Director General in India on 9th, November, 9th February. So this is there. So what do what would it ensure was is that portability of social security contributions should be there. Means if social security contributions are being made, like deductions are made from the salary for social security. So that deductions should be portable. If he's working for short term in another country and then going back to his home country, so that portability is required. Otherwise, if for his short term workers, it's it's money from his salary gone. And no benefit is, as such comes forth to him. So that is why portability of social security is one thing which should be worked on. Then fees or charges which are there for immigration or for visas, they have to be made reasonable, transparent, bringing in transparency in for visas, non-restrictive visa as such in nature so that supply of services is not affected. So these provisions are what India wants in trade facilitation services agreement. So this is there. So it will help in boosting medical tourism in which India is again a major hub to plus services which it provides IT, IT enabled services and workers working in foreign countries. So that is why this aspect is important for India. So it also says that there is a need for the all the relevant information 
to be available in all official languages of WTO so that free flow of data and information across the borders can also take place. So this is how it's linking it, how WTO members have adopted the TFA in goods, same way TFA in services can also be uh, effectively provided for. So it's just, this is a statement mix. It's making market access effective and commercially meaningful and it's not any new aspect which is associated with it. So we don't want any new issue. So this is also emphasized. This is no new issue. Then the next news item is digital payments costs are a hindrance. Try. So Telecom Regulatory Authority of India has again reiterated that digital payments which are asked for are a hindrance in bringing in a digital economy. So for smaller payments, if digital economic transaction is done, then the cost which is incurred, so this cost which is added to it will result in the transaction becoming so costly that it would not be practical. So that is why TRI has recommended that this merchant discount rate which specifically says that charges which are levied are unreasonable. There is no need for any charge being levied because there is no work done as such. So it's work done in course quotes to justify them like why are they levying these charges what is the service what was the work which they are providing there's no additional work done it says that's only some entry in some database which is done so that is why it says that the merchant discount rate has to be rationalized it has to be ended also it says that we have also reduced the charges the try has reduced charges on ussd based payments so unstructured supplementary service database payments through mobile phones, here also charges have been reduced. So that is why it is required that if this rationalization of rates take place, then only digital payments would be less costly and practically implementable. Another aspect, of course, which is important is cyber security related. So security risks, risks have to be clearly addressed until and unless that is not done, then digital payment pushing for them does not make sense. Then this is regarding the merchant discount rate, you can see. So this is the card holder. So when you when you use a credit card or a debit card which are, with a merchant, then the swiping which takes place of this card, a payment is taken. So apart from the payment which is due, another merchant discount rate payment has to be done. So this payment actually goes for this. So this is the card which is used, Visa or MasterCard or presently also we have our own Rupee card. So this card network transaction which takes place between the two banks. So for this, this merchant discount rate is charged. So even this acquiring fee rate is charged here for the acquirer bank and for the cardholders bank. So this is the merchant's bank and this is the cardholders bank. So here an interchange fee is charged and here an acquiring fee is charged and this is the master um, merchant discount rate charge. So this, all this is taken care of through this payment which is done by the cardholder. So that is being questioned that there is what is the transaction, what is the work being done in this case. If the card is swiped, what needs to be done is database has to, you know, has to be entries and has to be changed in these databases, entries have to be made. So for that, why do we have to charge a rate? But that is the service provided, that is the reason why they have this fee. Then other digital payments which are possible are for consumers like you have UPI based Bheem app. So unified payment interface based Bheem. That is Bharat Interface for Money. So this app was launched in December 2016 only during the monetization phase. So this app can, has been developed by NPCI, National Payment Corporation of India. And all the banks which have been brought under this unified payment interface can be accessed through this. So this is one stop location, means one app which can be used to access various bank accounts to all possible through this. But then for this, consumers require a smartphone and internet connection. So that is important. Even e-wallets which are there on various shopping sites or banks, all that also require you to have smartphone and internet connection. But then for rural areas, there's another provision which is there. So that is USSD, unstructured supplementary service data. So USSD codes are used. So these are used in normal phones. So in normal phones, if you remember for uh, knowing the balance as such too, you would have star one, two, three hash or something such, such code, which you would put in to check your balance, etc. So this similarly, this code has been provided star 99 hash. So through this, you can access your bank accounts. You can know your bank balance. You can do some transactions also. So this is possible through USSD too, means normal phones without internet connection to digital transactions can be done. And of course, other is debit credit cards, which can be used at shops. POS terminals being present at the shop. Shop means point of sale terminals on which you swipe your card. 
So if the merchant the shop has that, then this payment can also be done by the users. Aadhaar based payments can also be done. For this, you require only fingerprints here. No card is also required. So provided the shopkeeper has that provision for AEPS, Aadhaar enabled payment services. So he should have a smartphone and fingerprint scanner through which he can make this transaction too. So for merchants, of course, POS devices are there. Traditional POS devices, even mobile POS devices. So in mobile point of sale, this provision is also there connected to mobile phones. Then e-wallets, the phone to phone transfer can be done even using UPI Bhima. Again, direct account transfer can also be done. So this is how dig digital payments can be done, digital options available. Then this is regarding the Bhima app. So this is unified payment interface and USSD rebranded. So this is for shopping app as such merchant app. So you can do shopping through this too. You can, you know, banks can be accessed through this as well. So it, it requires a biometric reader and fingerprint scanner connected to a smartphone if Aadhaar enabled bank account is being checked for. So then this using this fingerprint scanner without any card also required transaction can be done. Then the next news item is cabinet not for rural digital literacy program. So this is Pradhan Mantri Grameen Digital Sakshata Abhyan for digital literacy. So it targets to make 6 crore rural households digitally literate by March 2019. So it has an outlay of 2351.38 crores and the targets which have been set for the financial years 16, 17, 17, 18 and 18, 19 are given 25 lakh candidates, 275 lakh candidates and 300 lakh candidates. So that's how it will achieve 600 crore rural households becoming 6 crores. 600 lakh means 6 crore rural households becoming digitally literate. The next news item is taking the scourge of plastic with bags made of cassava starch. So this is a company founded in Bali in Indonesia, Avni Eco by Kevin Kumala. So this entrepreneur has set up this company which produces biodegradable material. So this is takeaway food containers made from sugar cane and straws which are made from cornstarch. So this and the cassava carrier bags. So these are very much in demand too. So these cassava carrier bags are made from biodegradable material and they act as plastic bags. So you can see here. So I am not plastic is printed on it too. So this is the cassava bag. So this can be used for various purposes. So these are called bioplastics. So bioplastics are alternatives to plastic because it is not degradable. It takes a long time. It persists in the environment, plastic. So if these biodegradable material is used for developing alternatives to plastics, they are called bioplastics. These are made from materials such as cornstarch, vegetable fat, oil. So these, the plastic which we use is made from natural gas and petroleum byproducts. So that is why that persists in the environment and that is not desirable. So that is why her the alternative which has been provided is important especially in Indonesia because it has a huge problem of marine pollution because of plastics being disposed of in the environment. They go into the seas, they choke the pipes as such to risks of floods develop, even injury to marine animals take place and the cities are affected drastically. So this Indonesia which is the largest archipelago in the world. So archipelago basically means group of islands. There are around 17,000 islands which comprise of Indonesia and it is said to be the worst offender when it comes to marine littering. So it dumps huge amount of this plastic in the seas because plastic is used to that extent and since it's an archipelago the only way to dump it is in the seas. So that is the problem and it is second next to China in dumping plastic as such. So that is why initiative taken in this country is commendable. So this is what is discussed right now. Even Ellen MacArthur Foundation has warned that by 2050, there will be more plastic than fish in the oceans if you measure it by weight. So there, that is a huge threat. That is why biodegradable material, bioplastics are developed. That is good. But only concern is the cost involved because this is costly. Such bags are costly. So though they are popular, this is cassava is an edible tropical root. So that is cheap and abundantly found in Indonesia. So that is in demand but then the cost involved. It is cost around 2 rupees more than plastic bag normal one. So that is why this becomes non-feasible. So then UN body as well in 2015 has said that since it is expensive, it is unlikely to play a major role in reducing marine littering. So we need other initiatives too in regulating their production and usage rather than bioplastics which will have major impact on 
plastic littering. So that is what the UN body's viewpoint is on this matter. So this is bioplastic. But of course it is commendable that such initiatives are also taken. If there is awareness then people start using this and are ready to pay a little more price and change in behavior takes place then that would also be successful. So this should also be highlighted and not neglected in its concern for reducing the present plastic manufacturing and usage. The next news item is heavy lifting shift work from may harm women's fertility. So this is a study which says that if heavy lifting work is done by women or if they work in rotating shift patterns then the egg quality becomes poorer. So this is a study which is, is women fertility is affected because of this. The last news item is gecko does strip tease to avoid becoming lunch. So this gecko is a special kind of a lizard. It has been in use for various specific uh, you know, peculiar features which it has. Presently this has come in use. This is gecko lepis megalepis. So this is a little a particular species of gecko which is found in Madagascar. What it does is when it is caught by an animal which is going to have it as a prey, will eat it. Then it leaves its scales. It sheds its scales. So its body scales are shed. So the pink flesh comes and the what remains in the mouth of the prey is only the shells and it slips away and escapes. So this has been caught and on experimentation also has become difficult on it because by slight touch to it sheds its scales. So once the scales are shed then it's difficult to make a study of its specific peculiar features and the kind of scales and to specifically you know put it in a particular category too. So this is a new species which is being discussed here. Gecko lepis megalepis. The gecko species, these are lizard species. So they have been known to be leaving like lizards also. They, they leave their tail and go and they can regrow their tail. Here also they, they remove their, leave their scales and go and then they are able to regrow them in a week, in weeks as such. So that is how in a few weeks it can again regrow it. So this is in news. This you can see is gecko. Another peculiar feature which has interested scientists of gecko and has been in news earlier is regarding the adhesive, gecko adhesive system. So this hand which you see of the gecko, this has these foot hair. These foot hair, so you can see this is macro level, this is meso level, this is micro level and these are nano structures here. So they give a very strong adhesive, they stick very strongly. So this is also a peculiar feature which interests scientists. So that is it. These are the news items. Thank you.